Hello, and welcome to the CSAIL Alliance podcast series. My name is Steve Lewis. I'm the Assistant Director for Global Strategic Alliances at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, better known as CSAIL. In this podcast series, I will interview principal researchers at CSAIL to discover what they are working on and how it will impact society. Today on our podcast, I'll be speaking to Professor Yale Kalai. Yale is a cryptographer and theoretical computer scientist who works as a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England and as an adjunct professor at MIT in the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Yale graduated from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and worked with Adai Shamir at the Weizmann Institute of Science, earning a master's degree in 2001. She completed her PhD at MIT in 2006. Yale did postdoctoral study at Microsoft Research and the Weizmann Institute before becoming a faculty member at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She took a permanent position at Microsoft Research in 2008. Professor Kalai is known for co-inventing ring signatures, which have become a key component of numerous systems such as CryptoNote and Monero cryptocurrency. Her master's thesis, Introducing Ring Signatures, won an outstanding master's thesis award. Her MIT PhD dissertation was awarded the George M. Sproul's Award for Outstanding PhD Thesis in Computer Science. Yale, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Can you explain to our listeners the focus of your research and some of your aspirations? Sure. So my research is mainly focused on the field of cryptography. It's a very a foundational and theoretic in nature, though I'm really interested in real world applications. So, uh, you know, people, I think often when you say the word cryptography, people think of just, you know, how do you send a message securely so people can't see what's written there. Uh, but actually the field of cryptography has advanced immensely and it's way beyond, what we're thinking about is way beyond kind of securing communication. Uh, and it's more now in the realm of securing computation. And, you know, our world is shifting, like the way where we store our data often is no longer on our own private machine. We store it on some cloud servers. Uh, often we don't even do our own computation. This is done elsewhere in various cloud services. And mm -hmm. this raises a lot of new uh, questions and concerns, uh, both that of privacy, which is, of course, the bread and butter of cryptography, but also authenticity. How do we know that, you know, what the cloud server is telling us they're doing, how do we know that they're actually doing what they're supposed to? And how do we know that when we send computation somewhere that the actual computation is that we requested it's being done and so on. And even though this question on its own uh, does not seem related to cryptography because it's a question of just integrity, where is privacy here? Turns out that this is very much a cryptographic question uh, or, or we solve it. We know how to solve it using cryptographic tools, I should say. Uh, so this is kind of the type of uh, research uh, that I'm doing. Uh, in terms of aspiration, I think the aspiration for myself and actually for my field at large is to try to you know, address these new challenges as they arise. And every day we have new challenges, for example, COVID-19 brought a bunch of challenges with it, much of which are uh, cryptographic, uh, which I've been involved in an effort here at MIT, uh, which uh, is led by uh, Professor Ron Rivest and uh, Danny Weitzner. And, uh, uh, so challenges come to us every day, and my aspiration is that we'll be able to address it. And uh, as I said, my focus is theoretical, but I, I'm, my goal or my aspiration is to address these questions uh, by modeling them truth to the to reality. You know, you want the modeling to be correct. You want the to, to ask the correct questions. And then, you know, my solution are typically kind of the most fundamental one and the hope is that people will make them more efficient and optimize and so on and so forth. I see. So getting to the question of how do we know, um, does that um, beg the, the need for these proofs, for example? So can you explain at a high level the difference between interactive proofs versus classical proofs and our, our proofs, what is the answer to how we know? 
Good, good, good. So proofs. Yeah. So actually the concept of a proof really evolved in the last, I don't know, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, you know, those who are not in my field, uh, typically when, you know, we think of proofs, uh, you, you think of just a written, you know, what you did in calculus, or I don't know, in high school, uh, where you just write, you know, this implies this implies this, and it's just a sheet of paper with kind of axioms and implications. Uh, and this is the way actually people thought about proofs for thousands of years. Uh, but in crypto, we view proofs in a different way. And uh, because this classic way of thinking of proofs tend to be very uh, rigid and not very powerful. So in cryptography, for example, speaking of zero knowledge proof, you know, uh, so in the 80s, uh, Shafi Goldwasser from MIT and uh, Silvio Mikali uh, from MIT and Rakoff, uh, they were interested in what's called zero knowledge proofs. Uh, zero no it's nothing to do with interaction or anything. You know, at that point, we only had classical proofs. But they, what they wanted is they wanted proofs to reveal no information. You prove something so I can prove to you a sorry, I can prove to you, let's say that these two pens are identical, uh, or sorry, are different, but I don't wanna tell you why they're different. From your eyes, they're identical, I see a difference. I wanna convince you that they're different, but I don't want you to know where the difference lies. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, we don't know how to do that using a classical proof. That's just, not only we don't know, it's impossible. Because any kind of proof that's written, you know, you see it's some information that you can kind of carry that is a, it, it's a certificate showing that something is different between these two pens. So this is a test that's impossible using classical proof. And that's what led them to think about, to define the notion of interactive proofs. Turns out that with interactive proofs, it is possible. Okay, so the idea of interest, so what is interactive proof? It's a process between you and me. So for example, going back to my two pens, mm -hmm. uh, I can, for example, I can tell you, look, I know their difference. Don't want to tell you why. Okay, I tell you, my left is A, my right is B. Now I give you the two pens. You switch the order, don't switch the order, I'm blindfolded, I can't see. Then you give me the two pens and I can tell you which is A and which is B. If we succeed in this experiment many times, you're convinced that there's a difference, but you have no idea what the difference is because you knew if you switched or not. So by me telling you if you switched or not, you didn't gain any additional information. So this is kind of show, so, what they noticed is that the interactive proofs, when we interact with each other, yeah, so I give you the pens, you change, you don't change, you give me back the pen, it's some kind of interactive process. It allows for zero knowledge. It allows to give zero knowledge proof. But later, what was also noticed is that this is a much more powerful proof system, namely that we can actually prove, uh, uh, make proofs much more succinct, much shorter, much more easily verifiable. So it gives you two things. It gives you hides, you know, uh, zero knowledge, or it hides information, what cryptography is very good at doing. But the other thing it's doing, which is not often thought of as a cryptographic thing, is it allows for much more efficient verification. So if before to argue, to give you a proof of something, you would need to read, you know, 100 pages, now you need to read very, very little kind of communication but you need to interact very, very efficiently. So it's been proven very useful, this idea of interactive proofs. And would you say this is uh, useful for cryptocurrency, for yeah, so IoT it, devices, like smartwatches? It's, it's useful in many, many uh, applications. Uh, a, uh, cryptocurrencies are definitely one of them. As we talked about, you know, <laughs> the world evolving and changing, uh, this is again, one place where cryptography kind of plays a significant role. Uh, not only in the beginning, you know, using like a like the basic hash function signatures, which were kind of the original uh, Bitcoin kind of ideas, uh, but also now, as you said, a lot of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies use these zero knowledge proofs. And why they're so useful there is because they want to ensure that uh, things are private. So the problem with these cryptocurrencies is that they're public ledgers. And these public ledger stores all our, uh, all our transactions. And that's how it works. That's kind of what cryptocurrencies are. It's a public ledger that stores the transactions. The problem is it stores the transaction. You know, your, where you pay and wh who you pay to is supposed 
people really care about that part being secret. It's, uh, you know, you don't want to post in a public ledger. But using cryptocurrencies, that's what's done. It's posted on a public ledger. Now, people can say, okay, it's not really public because you're not associated with your name, you're associated with some public key. So nobody knows that Steve, belong, you know, is the holder of this public key. But these things, it's uh, anonymized. But we all know that, anon that this anonymization, say the word right, uh, mm -hmm. is not really uh, hides because you can trace information. So for example, if I know, okay, this public key bought, you know, I don't know, went to the drugstore next to your house. And then this public key also, you know, went and paid for a soccer team, which your son goes to. And I know, eventually I know it's you. And then I'll be able to trace all the other things you did, uh, you know, you paid. So, so, and of course you can generate many public keys, so maybe to hide, but usually, you know, it, it's a very difficult thing and often we can de-anonymize. So getting secrecy in, in cryptocurrencies is important. And there are several uh, uh, cryptocurrency companies, uh, some of which started here at MIT, and uh, which, which actually use these zero knowledge proofs. So the idea is you put your, your uh, things kind of, you use commitment, so you hide, you kind of, instead of putting in the clear your transaction, you hide it, and but you also add kind of a zero knowledge proof that this is a valid transaction and, you know, that things are good. But I want to say another thing, beyond hiding in zero knowledge, adding these succinct proofs, even if you don't care about privacy, helps a lot in efficiency. So currently the way, for example, Bitcoin works is when I, you know, if you want to pay me with your Bitcoin. You tell me, okay, I'm going to pay you with this. You see this Bitcoin up there? It's mine. I'm going to give you a Bitcoin. And it's with some number. This is my Bitcoin. Now, how do I know that it's a valid Bitcoin? So I need to say, you, you tell me, oh, I got it from Bob. Okay. So I go to Bob. I, I check in the, in, you know, did Bob give him? And was this not double spent? Maybe it was double spent. So I need to check. Now, where did Bob give, get it? How do I know that? So I need, oh, from Charlie. Okay. So I need to go all the way kind of to Genesis to the to make sure that it's valid. It, this does not scale. And everybody needs to verify. Every time you kind of people need to verify. So instead, if I just add a little certificate, like a succinct proof that, a, you know, that this is a good proof, then we're, then that's it. So that's what's done. I just want to uh, say one more thing, which, you know, it's interesting because you said, I, I started by saying classical proofs are too long. And the nice thing we can do an interactive proof. And now I'm saying this interactive proof is great. You can put it on the chain or, on, uh, you know, on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this point, I think our listeners and maybe you, Steve, as well, should be like, wait, wh who are you interacting with? It's a chain. So you're putting a proof, but you talk about interactive proof and this is just a chain. Where is the interaction going? And the answer to that question is actually, uh, we make the interactive using cryptography, and this is where kind of the missing piece is. Using cryptography, we can make this interactive proofs non-interactive. We can go back to the original kind of non-interactive proofs at a price. And the price is that uh, uh, we have, we have guarantee, our guarantee is that only a computationally bounded cheating prover cannot cheat. So you can think of it, the only way you can cheat is by solving a really, really hard mathematical problem. So solving factoring, you know, you can factor two really large numbers, which is believed to be really, really hard or something like that. So essentially at the end of the day, we have succinct, very short, non-interactive proofs, but the guarantee is only against computationally bounded cheating provers. Whereas traditional proofs, the guarantee is, is just a false proof doesn't exist. It's not about hard to find. Here, false proofs for, or for false statements do exist. They're just impossible. From our perspective, from real world perspective, quote unquote, impossible to find, but they do exist. And do you believe that that has been the most um, innovative thing to happen with cryptography in the last decade? So I definitely think this is one of the pillars. I'm super excited about this direction and it's wonderful to see how industry is excited as well. We've had, you know, conferences, workshops around this where, you know, we had such a wide range of participants from academics, pure kind of uh, basic researchers like myself and bankers. 
uh, you know, that want to use this, I, these ideas in their banking infrastructure. So this is definitely one of the pillars, but I would not say uh, the only one. Uh, for example, uh, one of the huge successes of cryptography in the last decade, which probably started a decade ago, uh, is the notion of fully homomorphic encryption. And which what it does, it allows, a, it allows us to encrypt a message, but then allows us to do computation on this message underneath the encryption. So we can compute on it without actually knowing anything about the, the computation itself. And this has been a very successful, uh, you know, huge line of work started actually with a student, uh, work of a student, Craig Gentry, who was then a student at, uh, uh, at uh, Stanford. Now he's involved with uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and, um, uh, so that's been a, you know, there's a huge line of work, one of uh, done a major participant in this kind of major player is uh, Professor Vinodin Kutanatan here from MIT, uh, who's done a lot of work and has been pushing it. Uh, also Shafi Goldwasser, uh, Professor Shafi Goldwasser as well from MIT, they've been pushing on it kind of uh, forward quite a bit. And, you know, it's very useful, for example, for healthcare, where we really are concerned about our data, but we want to do some statistics and learn information information without, uh, you know, so you want to do things under the hood uh, on, of an encryption scheme. Uh, so that's another one. And maybe the new kid in the block now, there's a huge uh, kind of excitement now in, in uh, uh, the crypto community is we have kind of a very, really great breakthrough results on the problem of obfuscation, which is how do you take a program and make it completely unintelligible so people can't reverse engineer or learn things mm -hmm. but can still run the program so this is called program obfuscation and this is again i think once we make it practical it's going to be extremely useful so far we didn't even have any like until very recently we didn't have any even heuristics for doing that and the last five years maybe more eight years by now uh maybe from 2014 so uh, seven years uh, has been kind of a huge boom on, in this field with a lot of really nice breakthrough results and very interesting math kind of coming uh, with it. So that's also very exciting. Uh, and there's a lot more, of course. That, that would be exciting. I, I think that the application would be for, you know, for protecting, you know, intellectual property, right, exactly. for software programs so that, you know. Um... Exactly. Can you tell us what excites you most about your research in your field? The problems we solve are very kind of nice and, you know, uh, well-dressed and look very beautiful. But at the end of the day, what we're actually solving are fundamental math questions. You know, at the end of the day, you sit with a math problem, and try to solve it. And we reduce it or we model it as a math problem that we at the end of the day try to solve. Uh, I really enjoy basic math and I, you know, I love uh, solving this problem, especially because there's a reason to solve them. They're not just, you know, math for the sake of math. But I think one thing that really excites me uh, is actually the people in my community. I think, uh, you know, the community of uh, theoretical cryptography is uh, a great community. We have awesome people and we're very collaborative. We work a lot together and, um, you know, it's just really, really fun. Uh, we work together. We try to, you know, I think one, one thing that really excites me actually is to work with the students and see their, the spark in their eyes when they, you know, have a result. It's, um, it's great. It's really fun. And I definitely think uh, beyond just the beautiful math and the great applications, I would put a lot of the fun and credit to the folks that work with me, including mainly my students. Mm -hmm. And speaking of community, can you tell us a little bit about your work at Microsoft Research? Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm a you know I'm a full time employee Microsoft Research, and I'm an adjunct uh, professor here at MIT. And uh, you know, interestingly, my work there and here is really the same. Uh, at the end of the day, my work is to advance the state of the art and try to have an impact. Uh, like all of us, <laughs> we all do kind of the same work, just different angles to it. Um, it's I find it really, really remarkable how this uh, engagement between MIT and MSR, Microsoft Research, is going so well. Uh, I think it's really, really valued by both places, which is really 
great for me. It makes me very happy. I think Microsoft Research uh, values the fact that I'm an adjunct at MIT. It values the collaboration. It values our connection. And, you know, when, when I started, I was worried that, uh, you know, Microsoft Research will not be happy that I'm spending a lot of time at MIT or, you know, like that MIT is taking me away from Microsoft or anything like that, or worried vice versa with MIT that, you know, this, but actually I feel like it's just a win-win. I think, uh, and I think both institutions view it that way. I think Microsoft is very excited about the collaboration. Uh, they're happy, you know, to have their student, our students at MIT being exposed to Microsoft and learn about Microsoft. Uh, they're happy with me teaching at MIT. Uh, and it's just been, you know, really great. Our students here at MIT come, well, used to a year ago <laughs> to come down the street and visit us at Microsoft all the time. Not only the students, also, you know, uh, uh, the faculty uh, from MIT and actually elsewhere also in the neighborhood and outside the neighborhood for long-term visitors. Uh, so uh, we've been having actually uh, with MIT in particular though, a very good uh, collaboration, co-organized seminars and workshops and crypto days and, and so on. Uh, so I feel like this collaboration between Microsoft and MIT has been wonderful. And as I said, in terms of my personal work, there's not that, much difference. I do the same thing beyond just, you know, just specific things like hiring there, committees here, students here, you know, but beyond kind of just a bureaucracy type work, uh, my basic work, the work I'm excited about most uh, is done in both. It's kind of the same work, which is just to advance the state of the art. I see. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing with Ron Rivest and, and COVID-19 and the I yeah, assume it yeah. has to do with contact tracing and yeah, and yeah, yeah. So this preserving. is exactly. So this is a big initiative, not just it's led by Danny and, and Ron Rivest, but it's actually a big initiative with mo many people involved. Uh, it's been a really interesting and uh, great journey. So our work in particular, uh, the thing I was involved in, it's a big, it's a much bigger than that. But the thing I was involved in is indeed the digital contact tracing and how what is the best algorithm. Uh, to hide. So what we want, we want to tell someone when they were close, uh, when they were in contact uh, with someone that was tested positive, but we don't want to reveal who that person is. And that the, doing it, uh, both actually doing it both uh, digitally, which is what we're trying to do, it's an automated contact tracing, and even manually actually, is challenging thing because you know, I want to tell you, you know, you were in contact. Now, it'd be good for you to know, for example, a little bit when you were in contact, like yesterday. But if you just met one person yesterday, then you may actually know who you were in contact, you know, who the positive person uh, mm -hmm. was. So it's a challenge to try to do it in a way that hides information. And digitally becomes much, much harder. Uh, because, um, if, for example, you know, if you know exactly when you were in contact, then it's, you know, you probably, you may get a lot of information about the person. If you know, oh, it's exactly at 2 p.m. yesterday when I was sitting in a cafe with my friend, you may know who the positive person was. Uh, but even more than that, a much bigger problem, how do, the, how do we know who you were in contact with? The reason we, the, the way we do it is we have your device, your cell phone in particular, uh, send little, what we call chirps around. And then when you tell us, oh, I was tested positive, we tell everyone, oh, listen, these chirps that you heard, that people hear chirps all the time. That's kind of our idea. These chirps that you heard is from someone who tested positive. Now, the basic thing you want to ensure is that chirps that people hear are not traceable. They don't know it's the same person. If you walk around with the same chirp all the time, uh, so maybe not saying Steve, 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 because that would be, but you know, whatever, just a, a chirp with random numbers, but it's the same number all the time. Again, I'll be able to trace you. Now I see the same person walking around. I see him going to MIT in the morning. I see them go, if, I, I, I'll know it's you, right? It's this kind of a, anonymization, which does mm -hmm. not work because we can trace. Uh, so we don't want to have the same trip. The, these trips need to be kind of changing all the time. But how do you do it in a private manner and so on? There is some, some challenges uh, to that. And here in this project, what was new to me, uh, which is something I haven't dealt with before, um, 
I think mainly due to the theoretical nature of my work, is it's not just a technical problem. There is a psychological problem. So when you tell people you should use this, it needs to be simple enough for them to understand what they're using. It needs to be, for example, uh, are you allowed to use location data? What if we use it completely privately? Like there's no way the cell phone will ever kind of reveal any location data. Is that okay? It turns out that Apple and Google are like, no way, we don't want to use it because it's bad publicity. Even, even if you ensure to us that, you know, nothing is going to be leaked, we don't want to use it. We don't want to tell people that we're using their location data. These kind of things are were things that I'm not used to, are not constraints that I'm used to thinking about. I'm like, mm -hmm. if it doesn't leak, it doesn't leak. You know, but even that is a problem because now you can say, okay, it, it doesn't leak. You're using it in a way that doesn't leak. Maybe someone else will use it in a way that will leak in a different context. So uh, what we're saving, what, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a more, a bigger problem than just doing the contact tracing itself, like putting in perspective and how people think about it and how Apple and Google think about it, the publicity that they get from it. it. Like a lot of things came into play while working on these things, which are things that I'm not used to, uh, thinking about it was really fun, yeah. and also the collaboration between you know uh, policy people and technical people and just you know uh, uh, health work people you know contact tracers. I just uh, you know a whole kind of new uh, collaboration, very diverse set of people was really uh, interesting. Yeah, it's it seems like it's a hard social engineering problem to solve, right? Uh, versus a, a, a technical exactly. or software engineering problem to solve. Exactly, exactly, precisely. Excellent. Well, Yale, thank you very much for your time today. It was fascinating. It was great to talk to you. And uh, I, we hope you uh, continue your great research at Microsoft. And we'll see you around CSAIL when we get back on campus. Yes, thank Have you so much. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.